as a student of Nietzsche, and which he was, he wrote, for example, there's a series of lectures that were published uh, as, as adjuncts to Jung's collected wor works that I believe are 2,600 pages long and they're written in very little type and all they are are commentaries on the first third of a book called Thus Spake Zarathustra which is a very short book of very bizarre quasi-poetry and it happens to be the book in which Nietzsche had his character announce the death of God so Jung was a real Nietzschean scholar so what Jung was doing see, he thought that basically that as we deanimated the cosmos, so to speak, you know, as, as the projections of deities that human beings had created had been pulled in from the objective world, they didn't disappear, they weren't destroyed as, as, as Nietzsche might have presumed. They sort of went into hiding inside the psyche, which is where they, ori where they originated from to begin with. They originated in the imagination. Now, a standard objective scientist would say, well, if they originated in the imagination, they aren't real, whereas Jung would say, don't kid yourself, the imagination is real it's just a different category of real and that you better learn how to deal with it because whether you know it or not you are pawns of your imagination in the same way that the Greeks considered them pawns of the, themselves, pawns of the Greek gods and so, that's a hell of a thing to realize, you know, and it's one of the remarkable things about depth psychology because the depth psychologists tell you flat out you are a house of many spirits and one of them is you and if you think that you are the most powerful spirit in your house of spirits all that means is that you're hyper protected and deluded because you're not there are things that are deep inside you and you can think of them as biological systems if you want which also manifest themselves in, in psychological phenomena that have more power than you do it's like, try not to make a fool of yourself when you're, you know hopelessly in love with someone you don't even know it's like, good luck to that, because you won't manage it and that's because the instinct that grips you when you're overwhelmingly attracted to someone is more powerful than you are and you do what it wants, even though you might want to fight back you do what it wants and there are reasons for that you know, some of them you can think of them as instinctual reasons so if, you know, if you're not overwhelmingly attracted to someone, at least throughout most of the history of mankind the probability was pretty low that you were going to initiate any sort of sexual contact with them so in, since, since that's necessary for the human race to propagate it serves biological purposes to have you play the role of actor of the demands of the instinct of reproduction which is of course also Freud's main claim, right? because Freud, who I place after Jung his fundamental claim was that the god that rules humanity is, is Eros, is se sexuality you know, and I'm always... he also he introduced an idea called the death instinct later and Freud w was also concerned about aggression but, you know, in some sense you could say that Freud believed that we were ruled by two gods, the, god of, the goddess of sex we'll say, and the god of war and, you know, as, as far as reductive theories go yeah, it beats most of the claims of postmodern scholars so... alright, so that's all pretty fun, you know so Freud, Freud's really, uh, in some sense, he's a 19th century atheistic thinker he's kind of like Dawkins and the other, you know, modern atheists in that ways um, in some sense a strict Darwinist and a biological reductionist and, but Freud had some very interesting things to say and one of them I really like I mean, I think Freud had it absolutely dead on here it's like, one of the things I've noticed in my clinical practice because I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist is that I never have clients whose parents made them too independent I always have the reverse not, not that all my clients have this particular problem but the fundamental problem is they cannot get away from their family they've been infantilized, or more accurately their families have conspired to have them remain in an infantilized state and so their world is the family they can't get out of the world of the family and so in some sense that's still childhood or adolescence because they're not dealing with the, you know, the, the concern of the broader world and so that's... the analysis of that was done by Freud most particularly in his conceptualization of the Oedipal complex now, Freud concretized that in a variety of ways that I don't think were particularly helpful, but he had his finger on the right button. You know, human beings are unbelievably dependent when they're born. 
So, a mammal of our size should have a gestation period of two years. You know, if it. if we were comparable to other mammals of approximately our size being pregnant for two years, that does not sound like fun but, you know, if you, if you look at animals, say, like, like, uh, like uh, deer or moose or animals like that pretty much, as soon as they're born, they can get up and walk whereas a human being, it's like 15 months, right? it's crawling around like, you know, a little <laughs> a helpless little thing I can't even stand up for 15 months. Well, that's because it's born, in some sense, in fetal form. And so that makes it incredibly, de it's kind of like a baby kangaroo, except it's more developed than that. Um, it makes it incredibly dependent in a way that no other animal is. And then, of course, it takes you, well, let's see, about 40%, 50% of people your age live in their parents' houses. You know, so you're 20 or 21 or 19 or whatever you are. It's like, you know, you're still dependent fundamentally. And so it's not that easy to break a dependence habit of 19 years. And you know, your parents may foster your independence and chase you the hell out of the house if they can and try to make you into a functional, try to help you become a functional and independent adult, but maybe not too. And it's the maybe not that's the big problem because it's actually rather frightening to develop independence even though you get to be independent, which is supposed to be the payoff. And it's easy for that process to be interfered with. And one of the things. interfere with it is maternal anxiety now paternal anxiety can interfere with it too but fathers tend to be substantially less anxious than mothers and so the classic Oedipal mother is anxious and so every time the child tries to do something that's independent her anxiety gets in the way oh you better be careful if you're going to do that it's like you hear that 5,000 times man you're not going to be able to take a step without you know without manifesting the anxiety that you've been taught by a powerful external force and that's the Oedipal complex in a, in a nutshell, fundamentally so that's a great thing to, to figure out and we'll look, I think we're going to look at a movie called Crumb which was um, 